Good morning, SNMA. Today I have the pleasure of having Dr. John Scriner here on the call. Dr. John Scriner, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Good morning, Jalen. Good morning, SMA. Jalen, thank you so much for having me this morning. I appreciate it. And uh, as Jalen mentioned, uh, Dr. John Schreiner, uh, Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs, also Assistant Professor, Department of Social Medicine here at the Ohio University uh, Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, HCOM for short. And uh, I've been privileged to, to work with the medical school here. I'm going on my 26th year uh, coming up in September 1. And I must say, uh, it's been a great ride. I've seen a lot of incredible growth here at school uh, during my tenure. And uh, it's a dynamic institution and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of, of this institution. Uh, originally from Jalen's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. I uh, came down to Athens in 96, uh, started out as uh, associate director and uh, then was named uh, director of admissions. Uh, then that elevated to assistant dean for admissions. And then in a bit of a reorganization uh, where we, we melded uh, two assistant dean positions into one associate dean position, and that was me. So now I oversee the admissions and student affairs function on all three of the HCOM campuses, Athens, Dublin, and Cleveland. So yes, sir. keeps me hopping. That's, I love it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for that uh, thorough introduction, Dr. Scriner. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, today, we're going to talk with Dr. Scriner about OU. Uh, what it means, OUHCOM, what it means to be a medical student at OUHCOM, the diversity of OUHCOM, and a few other things. So we'll jump right into it with my first question being, uh, what is OUHCOM's mission and what do they value as a medical school? That's a great, great question. And so uh, really our, our mission, you know, our medical school, we educate physicians committed to practice in Ohio. We emphasize primary care, certainly. Uh, we engage in focused research, uh, research, excuse me, we embrace both our Appalachian and urban communities and also integral to our mission, our college community commits itself to provide a clinically integrated learning center to osteopathic medical education continuum uh, for students, interns, and residents, and of course our primary care associates. And uh, we embrace diversity in public service and we look to improve the health and well-being of, of underserved populations. And, and, and really, you know, when you look at our essential values, you know, the foundation culture of our college really includes wholeness and balance uh, within each person, uh, integrity, uh, community mutual respect, acceptance of others, and embracing diversity. And we also uh, strive for the pursuit of excellence, uh, a climate of scholarship, and a commitment to service, uh, generosity, and compassion. And so it's, you know, our mission is uh, what gives us on a day-to-day -day basis, and our essential values get us in that quest. And uh, and I think we do a, I think we do a pretty good job of living up to our mission every day. Uh, it, it, it's very intent with great intent and very purposeful, uh, the things that we do to, uh, to live up to those standards that we set for ourselves. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Amazing. Can you hear me clear still? Yep. We're good. Got you. Thank you for that uh, response, Dr. Scriner. Moving on to the next well, question. Um, as we know, o OUHCOM is an osteopathic school. Uh, what could you explain what is osteopathic medicine and what is its importance? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Jalen. Great question. Um, well, I tell you, you know, osteopathic medicine, and you're right, we're the only osteopathic medical in the state of Ohio. And uh, we're one of, um, oh gosh, how many are there now? There's, it's ever growing. Um, 32. You know, I think there's over 40. 30 something. Like, yeah. Go ahead. I don't know the number off the top of my head. I think it's in the upper 30s. Yeah, there's, I think there's just another one that opened up this year. I think that's over 40, 40, 40 schools uh, with uh, over 50 some different campuses, 58 or so different campuses. And it's always hard to keep up with because it is such an, a growing, a growing uh, field of medicine, uh, the fastest growing medicine actually in, in the United States. Um, but osteopathic medicine, really its roots were deep in the, in the late 1800s and founded by an individual named Andrew Taylor Still, who was an MD. And he, he really, he thought that medical, uh, medical care, medical education uh, could be better. And so he really kind of stepped away from the allopathic uh, philosophy and defined what was known as osteopathy at the time and embraced some basic tenets of the, of the profession. And that is to look at the body as a whole and realizing that the body systems and structures are, are related 
and, uh, and that integrated relation, relation of the body systems and structure. And also that the body has the innate ability to heal itself if given the opportunity to do so. Um, and then also emphasize the relationship between structure and function, and uh, which ties into one of the unique aspects of osteopathic medicine, which is osteopathic manipulative medicine, um, where our students are trained to use that, that tactile sense, that sense of touch as a diagnostic modality. And then also to be able to manipulate those body structures and tissues to restore structure and enhance function, thus helping the body heal itself in a more conservative fashion before writing, you know, maybe some prescriptive remedy or, or uh, you know, doing some sort of uh, invasive surgical uh, remedy. And so that's an additional skill and tool set that the DOs have that uh, that MDs do not. And um, and it kind of adheres to the the basic tenets of uh, the Dr. Still articulated uh, back in the in the 1870s when he uh, when he founded osteopathic medicine. So. Uh, Dr. Sill is a DDO <laughs> of, of, the, of the profession. Um, and he was a very forward thinker. He was a surgeon in the Civil War, a uh, strong abolitionist. And when you look at, um, at the initial school classes at uh, the American College of Osteopathy, the first uh, he started, um, you'll see women, you'll see underrepresented folks. And so he, he embraced... Uh, uh, the opportunity to educate uh, osteopathic physicians to treat treat everybody. And, uh, but the big thing about osteopathic medicine, I think the a big takeaway is the patient-centered approach to it. And so or that holistic approach that you hear. So the physician wants to take that time to understand their patient and all those nuances that make up that individual. You're looking at things like maybe one's, uh, one's gender, one's life stage, one's culture, one's uh, race, ethnicity, one's uh, sexual orientation, one's psychological well-being, one's home environment, uh, one's occupation, their work environment, because understanding all these things that make up that individual is gonna put that physician in a better place to understand what's going on, arrive at a more accurate diagnosis, and to put together a treatment plan that's gonna be more readily adhered to, understanding that individual, uh, which is going to enhance outcomes. And of course, you know, that's, that's the bottom line is having positive outcomes. So that's a big part of, uh, of the aspect philosophy too, is that patient centered or the holistic approach. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well said. I couldn't have said it better myself as a, uh, entering DL student. Uh, but moving on from that, you spoke a lot about, you know, the principles of OUHCOM, what they're founded on, what osteo what osteopathy is and as a former director of admissions i'm sure you can speak highly to this next question being what does an ouhcom uh do applicant look like or in terms of you know what their uh not obviously what they look like but you know what their resume as we may say is made up of mm -hmm. and also what does a typical student look like once they get there in terms of how they continue what they already showed you during the application process throughout medical school Wow, great question, Jalen. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> this is my, let's see, 80, 86. I think I'm going on my 35th year of medical school admissions. So, uh, golly, I guess that makes me old, man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I've been doing this a while and I've seen, you know, tens and tens of thousands of applications to medical school. And so, you know, that, Applicants, it's really, I really enjoy reading files. I don't read as many files as I, I used to. Um, we break it up amongst our staff here in the office. Um, but, you know, each applicant has some unique qualities, you know, unto themselves. But there are some common commonalities too. And let's talk about that uh, first, I think. And so, you know, a candidate that we're looking at uh, is somebody that, you know, has demonstrated uh, strong academic you know, achievement, somebody who's done well academically, um, like yourself. And, uh, and so, because uh, we want to make sure that somebody has a, a good track record of academic accomplishment, because that leads us to believe that, you know, if they could be successful at their undergraduate or graduate studies, then they're in good position to be able to go on and, and handle the rigor and demands of the medical education, which is, as you know, taking it to the next level. Um, 
so we want to make sure there's that that uh, I guess that that academic acumen, you know, and ability and potential. We also want to make sure that that student is uh, has experienced a number of different uh, activities in terms of volunteer and service. That's very very big to us. You know, we're a very service oriented medical school, and we want to make sure that's much a part of the fabric of the students that are coming in. So getting involved with communities, getting involved with different uh, organizations, agencies, entities that are uh, designed to, to get out there and help people and make a difference in people's life, lift people up and, um, and, and help folks maybe through some troubled times. And one, you know, that's one, that's the right thing to do is to get out there and be making a difference. But it also helps, I think, candidates develop what's so important to us, and that's perspective. And the, the qualities that we're looking for, uh, empathy, compassion, caring, um, you know, building that, that good heart and, and that good service uh, commitment. So those are very important to us as well. So we're looking for that. The other, the other thing about candidates we're looking for, uh, folks that have some good clinical experience, you know, knowing what you're getting yourself into. Uh, it's, you know, it can look, medicine can look like one thing on the surface, you know, you, you watch, you know, some old reruns of, uh, of uh, take your pick of whatever show, you know, House or, um, you know, I don't know, whatever, Chicago Med, what have you. Um, and, you know, it can look like one thing on the surface, but I think once you, until you actually get into, into that clinical environment and start, you know, rubbing elbows with some of those folks in the healthcare team, the physicians, the nurses, the PAs, the NPs, all the people that make up that delivery team, um, you know, until you kind of get some of that experience and exposure, um, you know, you might not know just what you're getting yourself into. And we want folks to know what they're getting into, both with both eyes open going in, because it's a heck of a commitment, as you know. And we want to make sure folks are, are, are comfortable with that full commitment, because it is an all in, and, um, and also doing it for the right reasons. So we're also looking for folks who have a very strong altruistic spirit, you know, folks that want to be something bigger than themselves, uh, uh, capacity, um, and a relationship with, let's say, a training institution like HCOM, uh, but then also out in your practice uh, environment where you're uh, committed to making a difference in people's lives and in the community that you serve. And so we look for that, those sorts of qualities that will lend to that. Um, and so that we can build on it when we get when we get the student into the medical program here at HCOM. We also look for great writing uh, ability, you know, reading those, pouring over those essays. So we wanna make sure folks have a strong essay. Uh, so have proof it, proof it again, have somebody put their eyes on it and uh, make sure it's pristine. We're looking for good letters of recommendation. So you wanna make sure that, you know, you're asking the right folks for letters of recommendation. And, um, and if you're, you know, if it's a committee letter, you know, make sure that you're, complying with everything the committee needs you to do to get a good letter. And uh, then we're also looking for a timely application of a candidate. Um, you know, golly, I tell you what, Jalen, it's, it's August 6th and we already have 3,100 applications for next year. And um, <laughs> so, you know, as y'all know, it's competitive to get in med school. So, um, and this isn't a checkbox thing. You know, it's like, oh, I got a, I got a clinical experience. I got to get it. You know, so it's not a checkbox. It's really an experiential development of you uh, as an individual, both from an academic, experiential, life experience sort of um, perspective. Uh, also mentioned, I want to mention research too. That's something we also value as well. You know, that's part of our mission. Um, we know that not everybody has research coming in. We know some institutions where students are coming from aren't research intensive. Um, but if you do have research, you know, we're going to value that. Uh, probably going to talk about it in an interview, um, but we uh, we're greedy, Jalen. We want it all when we're looking for a candidate, and um, and we certainly found that in you, and uh, and that's what we look for uh, in our candidates. And and we want we want people that have a big heart and a good head on their shoulders. So, you know, if you look at our wait list, you know, you'd be amazed. I mean, there's people on a wait list with four points, three nines, you know, five twelves, five fifteens, and you think, geez, why didn't they get in? And it's like, well. You know, but they didn't have the right attitude, right perspective. You know, they had the academics and metrics, but, you know, it was all about, you know, it was all about them, you know, and, you know, what are you going to do for me? What's medicine going to do for me? And that's, that's the wrong perspective, you know, it's about what are you going to do? For, what are you going to do for that learning environment that you're training in? Um, what are you going to do for your patient? 
you know, that's, that's really what it's all about. So, and, and that's, that's what we look for at, at HCOM. Yes, sir. We, we, we do a good job of, I don't want to say break my arm, patting ourselves on the back, but we do a pretty darn good, uh, pretty darn good job each and every year. And Jalen, you got a great class coming in right now. I couldn't be more proud of the class of 25. Um, we get the right people on board and, and they do great things. Absolutely. I couldn't say the same. I concur. Uh, in that, you talked about uh, the commitment, you know, these incoming students have to have to, you know, practicing medicine and also the experience or the, you know, clinical side you like to see of them before they come in. So say they get accepted to their dream school, OUHCOM, what can they expect uh, for the program curriculum to involve and to uh, kind of translate into as they go through their clinical years and preclinical years? Yeah, <clears throat> so our curriculum is very integrated. Um, it's very team-based. And so, um, you know, what we do in the curriculum is that we, uh, oh, we have in the preclinical years, your first two years, we have, our curriculum is called the Pathways to Health and Wellness curriculum. And so our students are working uh, with, uh, with, with small groups the first semester is our wellness uh, semester. So you're looking at uh, patients that are experiencing a state of wellness. And so you're looking at, at clinical cases, dealing with well patients, you're applying all your biomedical science knowledge, all your you know, gross, histo, micro, farm, phys, neuro, biochem, all your biomedical sciences to its clinical application as it relates to uh, cases and scenarios and situations with well patients. And you're working in small groups and you're you're collaborating and coming to the optimal outcomes and answers to deal with uh, the cases and, and problem sets that you're dealing with. Um, the second semester, we go into the acute semester and a similar premise where, uh, you know, you're taking all your biomedical science knowledge and seeing its clinical application and its impact on patients that are experiencing acute conditions. And again, these are patients that are across the lifespan. So child, adult, elderly, and special populations for each semester. Uh, the third semester is the chronic, same premise. Uh, and then the fourth semester is, is the return. So it's kind of coming full circle. But our students are also getting involved in, with a lot of practical experience. Um, we have what we call CCEs, clinical and community experience. So our students get out and start seeing patients in their first month or two of medical school. Uh, so you're, you're able to see uh, the reality of patient care and relating it to what you may have been just learning, you know, in your in your I labs and in your small group activities and cases, um, we also have a lot of activity in our CTEC, our clinical training and assessment centers. So you're going to be working with standardized patients, learning a lot of different um, diagnostic skills, uh, different protocols, uh, and also working on your, your psychosocial skills. And then you also do a lot of work with our simulated patients, which are the the mannequins. And so you're learning a lot of protocols, procedures. And, and things uh, relative to, to patient care in that modality with the sim patients. So um, a lot of clinical experience in the first two years. And so by the end of the year two, you're gonna be able to do a complete H&P in a very efficient, effective manner. Um, you're gonna be exposed to, to EMR, you know, your electronic medical records. And so when you get to the third year, uh, you're gonna be able to hit the ground running. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, you're, you're impressing your preceptors, but most important, you're making a difference and you're very effective working with the patients that you're, you're seeing, uh, which is paramount. Third and fourth year, of course, it's all your clinical rotations. Some call it your clerkship, your three and four. Uh, the third year, you know, basically all your required rotations, family medicine, uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, gen surgery, psychiatry, um, uh, women's health, um, I think I'm probably leaving one out. Um, and so the third year is all your required rotations, okay? And you'll, you know, you're still tested on those. You're gonna have a coma uh, for each of the required rotations. Um, there's still gonna be didactics. So there's still some, some active didactic learning along with your clinical rotations. And then your fourth year uh, are a lot of elective rotations. And so that's when you can start to uh, do some of those electives or audition rotations, folks might say, you know, that relate to uh, discipline of medicine you hope to match to and practice. Um, so maybe, you know, let's say maybe, uh, uh, Jalen, maybe you're interested in emergency medicine, just sake of an example. 
And so you're, you know, you're on the HCON double campus. So, you know, maybe you want to do some of your elective rotations. Uh, oh, emergency medicine was also one of the required rotations, sorry. Um, and so emergency medicine. So maybe I do some more electives in emergency medicine and do some electives over at Grant Medical Center, uh, which is one of our hospitals, which is the level one trauma center in central Ohio. Um, and, uh, you know, to further your, your, your interest and, and curiosity and skill set uh, as it relates to, you know, you hopefully matching into an EM residency. Um, and so uh, the four years goes by really quick. It really does. You know, as fast as y'all think, uh, if undergrad went by fast, med school is going to go by even after time flies when you're busy. Uh, and, and we can keep you really busy. But that, that's med school, you know. Uh, it's going to be hard. You know, it's going to be hard. Um, but I tell you, we're, we're there every step of the way with you. And I think you might have some questions asking about student support down the road. And I can, I can tell you about a lot of the support we have for our students to, to handle the challenge and to navigate the journey. So. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You guys sound like you have a real thorough, thought out curriculum. And you also talked about, you know, one of your connections with the level one trauma at Grant in Central Ohio. So I was wondering, could you also touch upon any other additional resources and connections that OU HCOM offers? Uh, you know, I, I, I know, but let's uh, make sure SMS yeah. and these other upcoming undergraduate people understand the different uh, resources and connections you guys offer your medical students. Yeah, and, and that's one thing I wanted to add too, you know, to kind of building off the last last answer, um, you know, talk about resources and, and and connections and relationships. And and so, you know, in our in our third and fourth year, we have an extensive clinical campus system all throughout the state. You know, some medical schools have one medical center, you know, that's part of their, their medical school. Okay. Um, we don't have that construct. Uh, we have a clinical campus system that is throughout the entire state of Ohio. And so we work with the largest partners, uh, our largest clinical partners in the state. Um, and that includes the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio Health, the Mercy System, the Kettering System, which are some of the biggest, which are the biggest systems in Ohio. And so uh, we have a really wide variety of hospitals that we send our students to in years three and four. So if your aspiration was maybe a smaller community-based hospital, um, we have we have hospitals that are members of our camp, clinical campus system uh, that fit that, and then we also have the larger, you know, the larger major tertiary care facilities, level one trauma centers like a, a St. Vincent Mercy up in Toledo, you know, um, and everything in between. So uh, your assignments to your clinical campuses are kind of based on which preclinical campus you're coming from, whether it's Athens, Dublin, or Cleveland. So. Uh, we explain that to our students uh, early on in the admission process. Uh, there's information out on the, on the web too that you can find about how that how that clinical campus assignment process plays out. Um, but those relationships we have are really integral, I think, to our student success. Not only in outstanding training that they're getting in years three and four, but also the connections that you can make as it relates to getting to that next step, which is getting that that residency position, that GME's position. And we have tremendous support to get students to that point uh, where they're best positioned for the match. So um, I don't know if you wanna, if that's a good segue to talk about some of the other support we have. Um, but, you know, it's like I said, medical school is gonna be a, a, a journey um, and it's, it's a marathon, you know, maybe with a couple sprints built in. And so there's going to be a lot of people to, to support you along that journey. Um, you know, your faculty and the staff, um, we're here uh, every step of the way. Um, we have incredible uh, learning services uh, specialists that help folks navigate the medical curriculum. Uh, maybe you need to retool your study skills and, and approach. Uh, something that was successful for you in undergrad may need some tweaking or refinement or reestablishment to position you to be successful in medical school. We have people on each one of our campuses that are specifically uh, geared to help our students in that in that respect. Uh, we have incredible, I was just talking to one of our counselors earlier this morning, we have embedded um, psychological, clinical uh, psychologists um, for our campuses, because we know there's gonna be stress, there's gonna be, there's gonna be some high highs, there's gonna be some low lows, there's gonna be a lot of in between, 
And uh, no one should ever feel they're in this alone. And we know that the, the rate of burnout and stress uh, is great for medical students. And so we've committed the resources to having embedded counselors uh, specifically for the HCOM medical students. And um, uh, the support is just incredible here. I, I can't talk about it. And I think it just reflects you know, who we are and that's the HCOM family. Um, and talking about stress, uh, you know, is stressful matching these days? I know that you had a question, I think, uh, talk a little bit about match uh, on the list that you gave me a little earlier, Jalen, but um, we have an incredible residency advising team to help the students navigate the, the, the path to, to matching uh, into, your, into your residency as well. And we can talk about that a little later when you ask about, if you're asking about residency placement and stuff. But. Sorry, long-winded answer there, buddy. You're good, you're good. You talked about, uh, you know, the marathon that uh, medical school is and the highs and the lows. And as we know, almost in every aspect of life, the lows affect the minority of people a lot harder than it affects the majority of people. So I was wondering if you guys could talk, if you could talk about uh, your OUHCOMS diversity and what they're working toward in the future or what they have implemented to continue to develop and increase the diversity of underrepresented minorities. Thanks, Jalen, you're right. Uh, you're right. And so, um, you know, we try and, we try and do um, as much as we can. We need to do more in the support of, of our URM students and, and all our students, but specifically for our URM students, you mentioned sometimes the, uh, you know, the low lows maybe affect them more. Um, and so what we've done is about three years ago, three and a half years ago, you know, we have, let me first say, we've got a, a strong diverse population here um, at, at HCOM and we're always looking to continue to build on, on some of our, our past successes. And, and so we listen to our students and they're, you know, voice a lot of concerns and, and they let us know that uh, we have a lot more work to do. And so, um, you know, having, having those discussions really have put us in a better position to get some of the resources we need. And so about four years ago, um, three and a half years ago, um, we sat down with a bunch of, a bunch of students, uh, of our, our URM students, and uh, some of their concerns, some of, the, some of the needs, some of the issues. And so that was the impetus for starting our, our Office of Inclusion. And proud to say that our Office of Inclusion uh, was established about, I don't know, two and a half years ago or so with Dr. Tanisha King, it's our chief inclusion officer. Um, and we also have um, uh, Ryan uh, Clopton uh, Zimler up in, in Cleveland. Uh, currently, we're looking to hire for a position in, excuse me, in Dublin, which had been vacated. And, uh, and of course, the rest of the staff in the Office of Inclusion um, down here on the Athens campus. And so we wanna make sure that we get the resources in place to, to best help our students of color to navigate the challenges of medical school, to navigate the challenges of life and, and, and all the different societal issues and, and ills that, that, um, that face our students. And it's not, you know, I, okay, I'm, 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 I'm the old white guy in the admissions office, I get it, okay. But at the same time, um, you know, we can never fully appreciate what our students of color are dealing with but we can work with them to try and understand all the needs and concerns and, and get the respective resources we need to put our, our students in a, in a better place for success. And that's our commitment. Um, we have a strong SMA chapter and Jalen, you're gonna be a leader in SMA at HCOM. I just, I knew it when I was, when we were talking at undergrad, when you were an undergrad, uh, your, your leadership, I know is just gonna continue on through your four years of med school as is evident by today's conversation. Um, we also have uh, a med one of our embedded counselors, we have two embedded counselors uh, here in Athens. Um, and one of, one of which is Dr. Uh, Kristen Nichols. And um, she is, um, she is uh, an embedded counselor we share with the, the DNI, uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at, at, H at OU. And she's a physician of color. And she is one of our embedded counselors for our, our, our URM students and first-gen students. Uh, and so we've, we've made that commitment as well. Um, 
there's lots more to do. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're ready to, uh, to get the resources we need and put in place to, to make things happen. So uh, we can always do better. In terms of diversity of class, um, I'm excited that uh, this year we've got a diverse class. We've got, uh, oh, I think, I think we're almost 17% uh, underrepresented uh, minority in the entering class. I'd love that to be higher. Um, and I think we're about 20, I don't know, 24% or so uh, overall uh, minority, including uh, uh, ethnic minority in the class. Um, I think we're 54% female. Um, I think we're about 18%, 17 or 18% first generation. So we strive to, to try and get the most uh, most diverse class we can. It's, it's a challenge, especially here in Ohio. We have seven medical schools. Everybody's vying for that diverse, uh, great class. And, and um, you know, we, we work hard at that. Should we do? You betcha. Some of the things too, I wanna say other things were initiatives we're looking at doing. Uh, and Jalen, I know you're, you're working with Terry Porter and getting involved with one of the outreach programs we're looking to get uh, started uh, with uh, some further back outreach in medical school, middle school, middle school, excuse me. And uh, we also have some great outreach programs in, in the high school level up in Cleveland. Uh, we also have uh, some other programs that we have in place and have had in place. And I encourage, uh, I encourage students, undergraduate students to look into some of them. One of which is our summer scholar, which has been in place and extremely successful uh, since the mid eighties, which is a, a four week, five week uh, summer program here at the med school, rising, junior, rising seniors. Uh, in college and beyond. And it kind of replicates the first year medical school experience. And it has a guaranteed interview and a bit of a living allowance. And uh, I can say that we had uh, 23 students uh, this past summer uh, and 11 of them were accepted for next year. And, uh, and a couple of them are in our, in our post program. So we have another pathway program, which is our, our post back program. Um, and so uh, and then to follow that in the continuum of the pathway programs, we also have a pre-matriculation program um, for our URM students um, prior to the start of med school, which is a good uh, four week ramp up uh, with our faculty dealing with a lot of the subject matter that students are gonna be seeing in their, in their curriculum as they start off at the med school. So uh, there's a lot of programming in place. We're always looking to try and enhance that and, um, and put our students in the best position for for not only uh, opportunity and access, but for success they're here. You know, you can talk about recruitment uh, of URM students, but it's not recruitment as much as it is retention and graduation. Uh, it's all of that actually. So yes, sir. And you've got to put, you've got to, you've got to walk the walk. You just can't talk the talk. And I think that we do that at HCOM. Absolutely. Well said, well spoken. You know, <clears throat> I'll have a student, you know, they've attacked the pre the preclinical year curriculum. They've done their rotations at the clinic at uh you know St. Vincent, they've done their research, they've done all that, and now they're at the match stage and they're getting ready to go into residency. So could you speak about how uh OUH Con medical students fare and in getting into placed into their residency and what are you guys doing to make sure that you know you guys are trying to obtain that hundred percent match rate obviously yeah great question and really an important one too. Um, you know, it's becoming, uh, you know, for, for all, all the folks out there we're chatting with today, uh, um, you know, it's become incredibly uh, more competitive to secure your, your GME spot, your residency position, uh, now that we've gone to single accreditation. Uh, this was the second year for single accreditation. For those not familiar with single accreditation, let me give a little quick backdrop. So residency programs are accredited by certain bodies certain accrediting bodies. Okay, back in, you know, three years ago and beyond, there were osteopathic residencies, okay, and they were, they were accredited by the AOA. Okay, so they were osteopathic accredited residencies. And then the allopathic residencies were accredited by ACGME. And so um, for the last five, five or so years, they've been working towards a single accreditation. So merging the accrediting body to ACGME. So now all residencies uh, in the country that participate in the NRMP, uh, the National uh, Resident uh, Match Process, 
um, are all accredited by ACGME. And so with the single accreditation, it's become a little more competitive uh, for graduates to secure spots. I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, last year uh, we had, uh, it was 99% uh, match rate. This year it was 99%. And uh, we have, I did pull up a little bit of information here. I'm gonna glance over to my other, other screen. Um, so we had, let's see, and as I mentioned early on, part of our mission, we, we emphasize primary care, um, but then that, that's not the expense of folks being able to do you know, whatever they want to do, whether it's orthopedic surgery, emergency medicine, obstetrics, psychiatry, what have you. But um, this past year, we had 58% of our graduates uh, matching to primary care, which was, which was awesome. That's been a, that was a relatively high number for us this year. And so uh, also we had, uh, let's see, um, we had 86% of our graduates matched into their first choice of, of medical specialty, uh, which is positive. And then we had, um, let's see, we had 83% of our folks matched into one of their top three programs of choice. Um, so our students are, those numbers used to be a little higher prior to, uh, to single accreditation. But now because of that competitiveness, folks are having to cast a little broader net. Um, but I think those numbers are still very impressive. Our residency advising team is incredible. Um, and it's uh, Blythe Jonas heads up that, that area, along with Alyssa Addison and Megan Collins. And they start working with our students as early as the first year, sharing information uh, about what's on the, on the horizon, um, you know, as far as getting ready for the match, things you need to be doing, talking about the MSPEs, your, um, your medical student performance evaluation, and, uh, and the different things you need to be aware of as the match draws near. So they are really educating our students about the process, uh, the competitive nature of different specialties, and what you need to be considering when you're looking at you know, X, Y, or Z specialty. What are some of the things that program directors are looking for, whether it's board scores, research activity, um, and some of the other criteria that they look for. Um, so we've got an incredible team that works with our students and uh, they meet with each and every student individually uh, after the third year wraps up to get them ramped up uh, and, and in line and in tune for what they need to be doing, uh, again, as, as, as the match draws near. So um, a great resource right there. So yes, sir. we're no. fortunate. And I'm biased there in, my student, in the student affairs office. So. I work closely with them. They're awesome. Yeah, what don't you do, Dr. Franner? We appreciate you greatly. Uh, we touched on this last question just basically throughout the whole uh, conversation we've had thus far. But just to sum it up, how can someone, you know, recently uh, admitted into a medical school uh, be successful? And specifically at your school, how can somebody be successful throughout their four years at OUH time? Really good question. Um, one, I, I think is, it's really having the right attitude and perspective coming in um, and being ready to work really hard. You know, I think you, everybody has to be a little bit of realistic knowing that one, uh, it's gonna be difficult, you know, it's not undergrad anymore and that realistically know everything. And so you have to be very, um, oh, you, you've, you've, gotta, you've gotta leverage your resources really in terms of uh, support. So we encourage our students to reach out to our learning services folks right from the get-go. And I was talking to our learning services team there, there in my shop as well. And they said they've been working with a lot of, uh, a lot of the first year students, the incoming students already that have reached out to them early on. And I think having that proactive approach to leveraging your support resources before you get into a jam is a good thing, you know? Um, and so I guess I would, I would tell folks, don't be reticent to ask for, for assistance or help from our learning services, from your faculty, or even working with our, our mental health folks, um, to make sure that you're in a good place to be able to, to navigate the, the grind of med school, um, be a good team player, you know, come in with a, with the attitude that, you know, I can learn from everybody that I'm worth, you know? 
we all bring different perspectives. We all do different experiences, different skill sets. And to realize that, you know, looking around at your classmates, that everybody's bringing something to the table. And I can learn from, I can learn from something from everybody if I'm open to that. And we just ask folks to be open to the dynamic learning environment that is HCOM. That includes your classmates, your faculty, the staff, and, and others that are part of this educational enterprise at HCOM. Um, it's the HCOM family. You know, I might sound hokey. When you talk about the culture, people ask me, what's the culture of HCOM? I said, it's the HCOM family. I mean, everybody's in it together. And one of the things I can tell you, y'all know med school is competitive. I mean, that's a given, right? Um, and, and, and sometimes competition can be a negative, you know, a student against student scenario, you know, where you got gunners and I got to be the best at anybody's expense. Okay. That's, that's one form of competition. That's not how HCOM rolls. Our program, we're very competitive, but it's the students against the material. It's the students against the challenge. It's the students working together in a collaborative environment, collaborative fashion to get the most out of their program to be the most successful they can be. And so, you know, instead of cutthroat or backstabbing, which are terms you might hear in that student competition, um, you're going to hear terms more like collegiality, cooperativeness, and teamwork. And that's, that's really kind of what typifies our, our learning environment. And really, the Pathways curriculum that I described, uh, it really requires that collaborative approach. And, you know, people are all in it together. And I think coming in, you got to get it. You know, I always say, you got to get it. You know, you got to understand that we're all in this together. We can all benefit from learning from one another. Um, and that's what's going to create a more positive experience. You know, med school doesn't have to be a drag. Med school can be a fun experience and a good experience um, if you if you have the right attitude and perspective coming in. So if you approach it that way, leverage your, your resources of support and know that you're not in it alone and come in ready to work really hard, you should be successful. You should be very successful here at HCOM. Absolutely. Uh, man, my last last thing I was going to say was any closing remarks or thoughts, but you know, that pretty much summed it up unless you have anything else that you want, you know, our viewers to know about OUHCOM and you know, what they stand for. Yeah, man, Jalen, thanks for this opportunity. Um, thank you, SNMA and all those that are out there listening to the HCOM story. Um, I hope you find it exciting, as exciting as I do. Um, if <laughs> I say if HCOM wasn't all that, I don't think I'd be on my 26th year. I'd go, I'd hitch my, myself to another wagon and, you know, but, uh, you know, you always want to be part of a winner and part of a dynamic forward thinking institution. And I can tell you that's what HCOM is. Um, if it wasn't, I, I wouldn't be starting year 26. Um, so I guess I would just say, check us out. You know, I, I think we probably have the most user-friendly admission staff of any med school you'll find anywhere. Um, our door is open. Uh, whether whether it's uh, in person or virtually. And I, I encourage you to reach out. And, um, you know, if you're thinking about being an outstanding physician, uh, and I'll see more specifically an outstanding osteopathic physician, um, we would love to, to talk to you and see if there's an opportunity for you here at HCOM. So I, I thank everybody for their time and, and the opportunity to share. And um, let us know what we can do to help you. I mean, that's, that's what we're all about. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Spraner, for all this well information, uh, well given information that you gave us today. Uh, I look forward to putting it all together and I'll be sure to send you um, the final version of this. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day, Dr. Spraner, and thank you for this interview. Thank you, Jalen, for this great opportunity. Thank you, everybody. I hope this has been helpful and uh, I look forward to maybe engaging some of you and talking to you uh, down the road. So have a great rest of the day as well.